All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. Always exciting to kickstart one of these events and see all the viewers starting to tune in live via YouTube, see the faces who are joining us right uh, in the uh, right in the Zoom call. It's great to be able to keep the learning going during these challenging times and broadcast these events live into the homes of students, of parents, and of educators all across North America uh, and beyond. As I take a quick peek at YouTube, I can see we've got groups joining us in Canada, in San Jose, Rhode Island, Michigan, Los Angeles. So great to see uh, lots of groups joining us. Don't forget to let us know where you're watching from, send us in some questions, and we'll work those in a little bit later. But now let's get to the main event. So today we're pretty darn lucky to be hanging out with James Herrera. He's the program coordinator at the Duke Lemur Center Saba Conservation Program. Their mission is the preservation of natural lemur habitats, especially rainforests, and they do so uh, through community-based conservation programs. So James has a background in lemur ecology and is now managing these conservation activities, uh, you know, making him feel like he can act on what he's learned during his research and get used to a few more of these events coming your way from Duke Lemur Center. This is the first uh, of many events to come with all sorts of amazing scientists uh, from the center. We're going to learn a lot about lemurs over the next few weeks. I'm pretty excited. So James, it's so great to have you joining us live today. We're excited to get to know you a little bit better and your program. And then of course, we're going to fire away with a little Q&A action. That's great. I'm really excited to, to be here. Thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to talk with so many people around the US and, and North America about what Duke Lemur Center is doing in Madagascar and just about Madagascar in general, um, because it's such a fascinating place, but so few people get to go there. So really excited to share a little bit of it with you. All right, that sounds great. I often hear Madagascar referred to as, as almost its own planet or this island of biodiversity. So uh, when you're ready, we're excited to jump in. Cool, I'll go ahead and share my screen. It's true, folks often refer to it as the eighth continent, but it really is like stepping into a whole world of its own. So just let me know if you can see the slides all right. Yeah, looks good. So I wanted to take today as an opportunity to give a little bit more introduction and background to Madagascar. And so in the spirit of exploring by the seat of your pants, in this uh, talk, I'll, I'll be exploring the social and ecological links between people and nature in Madagascar. And just to let you know, I'm gonna do um, kind of like three sections, hopefully about five minutes each, and then I'll pause for each section so that you can ask questions because um, there, we are gonna take some different directions. And so I don't want you to have to hold on to those questions until the very end. Um, and let me know if I'm going too fast or if you're bored to tears. <laughs> So I'll just start out with uh, a, you know, a little general about Madagascar. As we just mentioned, it's an island, but it really is like the eighth continent. It's just off the Southeast coast of Africa and it may look small next to Africa, but it's actually uh, the fourth largest island in the world. It's about the size of uh, the state of Texas and it's uh, very long, it's like a thousand miles long. And because it's situated in the tropics, because it's an island in uh, the Indian Ocean, there's a lot of different geographic variables or factors that play into what makes Madagascar so special. So in this map, you can already kind of see there's like a green side on the right or on the eastern side. And the western side is very uh, gray. And that gray or beige, that's indicating that there's not that much tree cover there, whereas on the east, the green is a lot of tree cover or rainforest. And the reason that it's concentrated in the east is because of something called orographic effects. So that's when the, um, the warm, moist air and wind coming off the ocean hit these mountains. And as they climb up the mountains, that water vapor condenses and it rains and it dumps tons and tons of water on the land, which makes it great for plants to grow. But once you go to the other side of that mountain, it's called a rain shadow. All the uh, moisture has come out of the air in the form of rain. And now on the other side, it's very dry. So that's one of the factors that creates this mosaic in Madagascar. So as I mentioned on the east, there's the mountains with the rainforest, and this is really lush tropical forest full of plants and animals. Uh, once you get to the tops of those mountain peaks, it's really like you sometimes like you stepped onto the moon, um, but then you see these little swampy marshy areas that are kind of like the moors of England. And then as you get farther west in the plateau, it's this big open, very dry grassland and you'll just see a few uh, communities or settlements scattered around in this grassland. 
But every now and then you find these little pockets of what we call wooded grassland. And that's where you still have enough moisture uh, that there can be trees. And there's places that are like the Grand Canyon in the US. And you're in this kind of bad land where you can't figure out where there's any water to support this life. And then boom, there's an oasis that you know is just such a relief to jump in and go for a swim. <clears throat> Keep going further west and there's no more uh, swimming pools. It's just this dry deciduous forest, the famous baobabs that you uh, may have seen in the imagery. This is one in the center, but it doesn't look uh, all that spectacular now because it's in the peak of the dry season. All the trees lose their leaves. It really only rains about one or two months out of the year. And uh, go further south and it's really almost a desert. Uh, they only get rainfall a few weeks, if that, out of the year. <clears throat> and all these plants that may look like cactuses, uh, they're actually not cactuses at all. They're unique families of plants only found in Madagascar and they're covered in spines just like cactus, but it's a unique um, convergence on the same kind of uh, uh, morphology or anatomy. So of course the lemurs are very famous. Uh, they're the only primates in Madagascar. Primates uh, include monkeys, apes, and people, but only in Madagascar can you find lemurs. Uh, that's what we call endemic. It means they're only found in that one place. And uh, there's about a hundred different species that are alive today. They range from the smallest species that are on this left side. Let me know if you can see my cursor. This left side of the graph um, where you can see this is the mouse lemur and the dwarf lemur. These are nocturnal, which means they're active at night. And that's why they have these big eyes because they've got to uh, take in as much light as they can. They're very small. The mouse lemur, it gets its name because it's about the size of a mouse. It fits in the palm of your hand. And they eat insects and very small fruits. But as you move to the right on this uh, picture, it gets bigger body size. This is the famous eye eye here, which is very rare. It's only active at night uh, and it's very difficult to see them. In many years of searching at night in Madagascar, I've only seen them twice. Um, this is the famous ringtail lemur here at the bottom, but then there's also species that are kind of like pan mini pandas. They're adapted to eating bamboo, which is a very tough food to eat. And uh, down at the bottom right, this is the Indri. This is the largest living lemur. It's about the size of a German shepherd and about 22 or 25 pounds. And it's a really special animal. And I wish I could just spend hours telling you all about these animals. But you're, as, as Joe mentioned, you're going to be getting a lot more media on lemurs in the weeks to come. And so I'm going to leave most of the fun part of talking to lemurs to my colleagues at the Duke Lemur Center who will fill you in more. But at this point, I'm just going to take a brief pause, and I want to see if anybody has any questions so far. All right. So to those tuning in via YouTube, if you have any questions about what James has talked about so far, um, send in some of those questions. As well, those who are in the call with us, raise your hand digitally. You can raise your blue hand, and I will know to pick you, or send something in the chat. I'm watching both. And we've got Cordelia and Huxley joining us in Waterloo, Ontario, and looks like they have a question. Um, my question is, what's your favorite type of lemur? Great question. Thank you. My, I, I love to be able to talk about this. My favorite, let me go back to that slide with these cutie lemurs. This is my favorite. This is the dwarf lemur. Um, they're called dwarf lemurs because they are so small. Um, and I forget what it is in um, ounces, but he's about a, a 300 or 500 grams. That's like... Um, maybe not even one pound, less than one pound, I think. I have to do the math. <laughs> but they're really cool. They're small, they're nocturnal. They run around at night, um, which is like a very difficult thing for most primates to do because primates like people are very visually oriented animals. But the dwarf lemurs, they have these big eyes, they've got a great sense of smell. Um, and they're really important in the environment too. They're known to be pollinators. So they'll stick that little snout deep inside a flower to eat the nectar. And then they get their faces covered in pollen. And then when they go to the next flower, they mix that pollen and that helps the plants to grow. They're also seed dispersers, which means that when they eat fruit, uh, it goes through their stomach and they poop it out. <laughs> and they're like the farmers of the forest. Those seeds actually germinate. They grow better than when they're not eaten by lemurs. And so they help to grow the, the forest. Um, there's lots and lots of other factors that are cool about them. If you go to the very high mountains, you find a different species that's really only found at the high mountain peak. And then when you go to lower areas, you get a totally different species. So for all these reasons and more, they're my favorite. 
All right, good answer. Uh, tuning in via YouTube, we have Carla, and Carla's curious about predators. What are some predators of lemurs? Yeah, there's a, there's a unique group of carnivores on Madagascar that are actually more closely related to uh, hyenas than they are to like dogs or cats, even though the most famous one, the fusa, kind of looks like a, a dog-cat hybrid. Um, and, but they're totally unique. They probably got to Madagascar somehow, just like lemurs by rafting from Africa. And, um, and they're quite diverse. I forget exactly how many species, but you've got a small one that kind of looks like a ring-tailed ferret and they are omnivorous. They run around eating just, just about anything. Um, but then you also have the biggest one, the fusa, and that is the big predator for the large lemurs. So these guys that you see down here at the bottom, the uh, shifaka, the varicia, the rough lemur, um, these are actually the big prey items for the fusa. So the, the lemurs are also very important as food for the predators. You can't have these big predators without having lemurs. All right, we're gonna grab one more before we let James continue. Brianna, I can see that your hand is up. Uh, do you wanna unmute for me, Brianna? Hi, um, what is the lifespan of most lemurs? Thank you. Yeah, this is, um, it's, it's hard to give you a, a, a perfect answer because first, you know, studying them in the wild, they live very long. So it can actually be really hard to, to spend enough time doing the research to see how long they live. But also because uh, lifespan and other features of what we call life history, things like when you reproduce, when you age and things like that, uh, it's very closely related to body size. So as you might uh, guess, the smaller species live shorter than the bigger species. But to give you an idea, in the wild, some mouse lemur species may only live one to three years. Others have been found to live four, maybe even 10 years in the wild. But then in captivity, they can actually live to, and I'll have to check with my colleagues at the Duke Lemur Center, but they can live to be over 10 years old in captivity. These little guys the size of a mouse. When it comes to the shifakas, actually my PhD advisor uh, is one person who's done a lot of research on the lifespan of the shifakas, and in the wild they can live into their 20s and still reproduce, no less. And they've actually even shown that when they get older their teeth wear down so much uh, that that's one of the factors that actually causes them to decline over time is that their teeth just wear out and they can't chew as well. All right. So James, let's carry on and then we'll do another little Q&A portion when you're ready. Great, sounds good. Well, now I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the Malagasy people. Um, they are a fascinating group. Um, they, just to give you a, a little bit of a sense where the, the timeline of Madagascar and human history has changed significantly in the last few years. For a very long time, we thought that the Malagasy people first got there about 2000 years ago. Then there was some really cool archaeological evidence that came out that suggested 4,000 years ago. And just recently, they've found some bones of animals that have cut marks on them that indicate maybe people were on Madagascar as long as 10,000 years ago. Now, as late as that seems, it's actually very recent in human history. Uh, if you think about it, one of my colleagues at the Duke Lemur Center, Matt Horst, likes to point out that you know people were already building castles and and well, at the time when people got to Madagascar. So it's very, very interesting that we have um, this kind of really recent history that then diversified. And so I'm just giving a, a, a couple of photos of friends and colleagues in Madagascar and folks that we've worked with in the villages. And so this is a map of the uh, distribution of different ethnic groups in Madagascar. There's actually 18 different ethnic groups and they are kind of distributed across the island. You can see that they form little pockets where you have uh, distinct groups. And each of these groups has a really intimate and unique um, system in which they use the natural environment around them. So you can imagine the people who live in the rainforest, they've got a very different culture and, and system of living than the people living in the dry forest. And so just like with the plants and animals that we see this diversity, we see diversity in people too. And the people really depend on these natural resources because um, for the longest time, they, they have largely been subsistence agriculturalists. And to this day in the countryside, subsistence agriculture means growing enough food to feed your home and your family, not really enough to, to sell a lot. 
Now, of course, there are many big cities. It's getting quite developed. Uh, there's 25 or more million people in Madagascar. And the cities are, are becoming quite modern. There's internet cafes and things like that. But when you go out to the countryside, people still depend very heavily on what we call ecosystem services. Now, all people depend on ecosystem services because these are the services that nature provides for people for free. Things like the oxygen we breathe, the water that we get comes from a natural water cycle. And especially important for the farmers and people in Madagascar are things like uh, creating the soil fertility, the forest and all those leaf litter and roots and things like that. That's what really creates the soil. And the soil is a living ecosystem with different kinds of fungi, bacteria, and even animals that, that make the soil strong and good for uh, plants to grow. Uh, the forest is also very important because those roots of the trees and plants hold the soil together and prevent erosion. And that's super important because without that, uh, that root system, the soil can just wash away. So the people really uh, in Madagascar really know this and depend on this day to day. And I want to give an example of this tree, the Ravanalo, or the traveler tree in English. Uh, it's standing right here. It's got these big, huge uh, leaves that look like palm fronds, but it's actually not a palm. And people really depend on this tree. It's actually the national tree of Madagascar because of its many uses. Um, the leaves, when they cut these and dry these, they use these as thatch for the uh, houses, the roof of the houses, just like in this picture. But they also use the trunks of the tree for building. And they, uh, if we go back to that slide, there in the middle, where you can see the leaves coming together, inside of that is like a big heart of palm and the people can eat it. So. That's just a few of the uses that folks have for the Ravanala tree. Bamboo is also another important uh, resource, especially in the East. Bamboo is really great because it's pretty strong and durable, but it's also very fast growing. So it can be used in a sustainable way. And people use it for a variety of things. Here, one of uh, a, a, a person from the village has collected some bamboo, <laughs> excuse me, they cut it in half and hammer it to flatten it out. And then they can use it to weave the walls of their homes or the roof. This house is, is a little bit uh, fallen out of disuse, but I thought it's such a good example of how intricately they use these bamboo uh, products to make their homes. Um, and of course, uh, they're, they don't you know, go to Lowe's or Home Depot when they need to buy uh, wood for building their house. They, they go to the forest. And so they collect these timbers that they, they have this really great knowledge. They're like the best botanists of which trees have the right wood for different uses, uh, how quickly the wood will rot, things like that. There's also a lot of other products besides just construction, like food. Uh, people in Madagascar get a lot of food from the forest, fruit trees, things like that, um, but also honey is a very important product. And here, one of the farmers has just collected uh, honey straight out of a wild beehive, uh, really amazing skills. There's also edible insects. This is one of my favorites that a colleague of mine, Courtney Borgerson, has turned me on to. It's called a sakunji uh, or a lantern bug, if I'm not mistaken with the uh, common name. And it's edible. Uh, believe it or not, once you boil these, they taste like bacon and eggs. And it's got lots of protein and iron, which is very good and healthy for, for people in Madagascar. Um, we're, I'm going to talk mostly about agrarian or rural or farming communities. These are all the words we use for referring to farming. Um, and here we can see a Malagasy a woman farmer in her rice field. Uh, rice is a very important crop for the people there. They eat more rice in Madagascar than any, anywhere else in the world. Um, and it's a very important part of their culture. I forgot to mention that um, the origins of Malagasy people uh, probably is a mix of um, coming from Borneo in Southeast Asia and Africa. And so we know this based on the language. We can tell it's a mix of Indonesian, Polynesian, and um, sorry, not Polynesian, Indo, Austrian, something like that, and um, Bantu from East Africa. Um, but so the, the, the people who came from Southeast Asia brought with them this rice culture. And so here we see rice, but also beans and corn. Here is a hillside where they're growing corn and cassava. These are really important crops that they eat almost every day. Um, people who own the low valleys, 
they can have these really big expansive rice fields which are very productive they, they can make a lot of rice and if you see a stunning uh, landscape like this I mean just imagine the amount of rice that, that farmers can cultivate on in the foothills of these big beautiful mountains but um, you know valleys are only one kind of landscape and actually this is a very um, rough very mountainous area and so valleys are hard to come by most farmers don't own the valleys and so when they have to farm they go to the hillsides and they use what's called slash and burn so this is where the farmer will, will cut uh, a little piece of the forest and let all that vegetation that you see dry and when it's nice and dry they will burn it and by burning it this produces a ton of ash and the ash has lots of nutrients in it that provide like a quick fertilizer to grow their crops their rice now this is usually only done once and then the land has to rest or be fallow for a few years to let the vegetation grow back to repeat but unfortunately because the land is kind of all being uh, used up the farmers are returning to that same land repeatedly and um, it really quickly starts to lose its fertility so here we can see this kind of mosaic landscape where in the valleys you've got these uh, rice fields but then the hillsides, you can see some areas like here that have just recently been cut and burned, other areas that are kind of regrowing, little patches. And then up here where you still see forest, this is actually a national park. So the farmers are not allowed to go any further. Uh, but where there are no national parks, we often see that the hillsides become uh, totally cut. And this can be really difficult, not only for natural habitats, but for the farmers because the soil has lost its fertility they can't get a good uh, harvest from that land anymore. And if you see down here, this is what we call like a, an erosion gully. The, like I said, without the trees to hold that soil together, the land just kind of collapses. Um, so this is uh, a very common problem that we see across the world, um, especially in the tropics. And now we're just gonna look at Madagascar. This is a, like a Google Earth image where the green again is the vegetation. And here the pink, is habitat loss based on satellite imagery. Uh, so we know that even in since 1950, about 40% of the forest has been cut in Madagascar. And the, uh, the sheer amount is really hard for me to wrap my mind around. If you can imagine this, it's equal to about 1.2 million soccer fields or football fields uh, just in the last 60 years. And I'm gonna zoom in to the Northeastern part of Madagascar, which is called the Saba region. And this is where the DLC is doing our uh, outreach and conservation. So in the Saba region here, the green is showing forest cover. And up in the top, you can see this is a, uh, an aerial photo, a photo taken from planes in the 1950s. And then starting in the 1970s, we have satellites, satellites that can take pictures of this, of this land cover and give us the updates. And then in 2017, we can really see how the forest has shrunk just in the last um, 18 years, 20% of the forest in, Madag in the Saba region has, um, has disappeared. So this is not uh, only about preserving natural places for lemurs and other uh, wild species, but it's also about those ecosystem services that the people rely on. And so I'm gonna take another pause here and uh, see if anybody has any questions about this section. All right. Awesome. So again, let's get a few questions coming in via YouTube. I see a few hands uh, up already in the Zoom call. I do want to announce as well that I did, while James was talking, I, I opened a Slido room and I put together a little quiz to see how well people were paying attention. So we've got a little interactive quiz. I've shared the link uh, in YouTube. So you just have to click the link. It'll take you to the quiz sign up. Just pop your name in. And then after James finishes the next portion of the talk, we will jump into the quiz and we'll see who comes out on top. It's timed and obviously the right answer is important too. And we'll see who our top three are, uh, top three students are in the event. All right. So Brooklyn, Brooklyn, do you want to unmute for me and you can go ahead and ask a question. Forget or protect. Hi, so do you know the tree that he showed us? Is that like the tallest tree in Madagascar? Because it looks like a really tall tree. Well, uh, this one's actually, it's, it's all about the perspective. So in this picture, I'm going to zoom all the way back. In this picture, we're actually, I'm, I'm up on a hill and the tree is growing on the slope below. So it, it is probably about, I'd say, maybe 30 feet tall or more. 
but uh, no, they're not the tallest trees. These are, are actually, they don't get that tall um, because they're a fast growing tree that grows especially well in this open area, but they don't live very long. So they'll, they'll usually die uh, you know, long before they get to a height like these other forest trees. But deep inside the pristine rainforest, the trees are amazing. It's like being inside of a giant cathedral because you've got these massive trees that are almost a hundred feet tall. Uh, and not only that, but they're enormous. Like it takes multiple people to wrap your arms around this tree. And the, the understory or the floor of the forest actually gets very open and very thin because those big trees cause it to be so dark that very little uh, uh, vegetation can grow below it. All right, let's grab a question from Ava in Wisconsin. Your mic is on. Who was the first one in Madagascar? Like the first people? Yeah, we're really not too sure, to be honest. Um, but uh, as I would mention, and I actually think I fumbled with the, the wording, but we think that people came from Borneo, at least some ancestry came from Borneo, like maybe 2,000 or 4,000 years ago. Uh, and Borneo is an island in Asia, so probably the people sailed to Madagascar. But we also know that there were some people who came from Africa. And it's very difficult because we don't have much uh, archaeological evidence. And also because there was not a written history in Madagascar until very recently. So we're not too sure. That's still an open question that scientists are trying to figure out. All right. Let's shift over to YouTube because I know we have a few questions there. Uh, let's see. Uh, Valentina is tuning in and she's wondering if there's efforts being made to replant the forest. Thank you for that question. And actually I'm gonna hang on to it because that's the last section of, of the presentation. All right, perfect. A little teaser of what's coming up. Um, let's see. Oh, here we go. Jamie wants to know about the population in Madagascar. What's the, roughly the population size? About 25 million people and, and growing. Um, so it's, uh, you know, just like in a lot of the rest of the world, the population growth rate is pretty high. And so it, you know, it's about 25 million now. It's predicted that it might even double within the next 30 or 40 years or less, perhaps. All right. Well, one more reminder to jump into the Slido room with the link and get ready for the quiz. And we'll take it right after James finishes his next session. Then we'll wrap up with a few more questions. All right, James, take it away. Great. So uh, I, I really appreciate that question about what the efforts that are being made for reforestation. And that's a little bit about um, what the, it's, a, it's a very big push, you know, in the last 50 or 60 years, but especially this year, the president of Madagascar has made a big commitment to reforest. He plans to, and, and as a country, they plan to plant 60 million trees in honor of their six, 60th anniversary of independence. And they're doing a great job already. Uh, so uh, I can talk about that more towards the end. But the Duke Lemur Center, uh, as you may know, is an organization that's based out of Duke University in North Carolina. Uh, but we have a program in Madagascar called the Saba Conservation Program. And so this is what we call a community-based approach to conservation. So that means that we work very closely with these communities, uh, the local stakeholders, uh, which is to say the people who really have the biggest stake uh, in the projects. And so for us, this especially means the people who live out on the forest frontier, those farmers that I told you about. So we meet with them in their, uh, in their villages, in their farms, and we do a lot of meetings and listening and interviewing. So here I'm um, speaking with some of the village elders about you know, their visions for agriculture, the challenges they face. They, you know, they're telling us about how they get decreasing yields, they want to be able to diversify and grow more different crops, uh, some for food and some for, uh, for selling. So we try to really listen. We, we do these uh, group meetings so we can hear a lot of different voices. We do one-on-one -on -one interviews too so that we can collect real um, data, sociological data about things like food security, agricultural productivity, health, and how they use the land. We work very closely with uh, several different partners, but one that I really want to highlight is the university in the Saba region. It's called Cursa. 
And uh, it's a really uh, vibrant, uh, enthusiastic group that I'm really enjoying working with. I also want to point out my partner, Laura Diara, here in the middle, uh, who's uh, the Duke Lemur Center liaison in Madagascar, and she works with us on all these projects. Um, this is the director of the university, Christophe Manzari Bay, um, one of the teachers, Paul Jeans. And uh, here is Evra and Torien, two recent graduates who have become entrepreneurs in conservation. And so by working with these and collaborating, we're, um, we're partnering with them. You know, we, we can really work through their system to, to know that we're doing um, things that are sensitive to the local culture. So one of these is agroforestry. As, uh, as one of the students asked, what are we doing to, to replant these trees on the landscape? Well, one means is called agroforestry. This is a mix of agriculture and forestry, planting trees within the agricultural landscape. So we do this through partnerships. So again, here's uh, members of CURSA, the university, 100 students and teachers volunteered to help the local ministry of the environment, these folks here on the side, that have created tree nurseries. In this particular tree nursery, over 60,000 seedlings were produced when we took this picture. I think there are already over 100,000 by now. And they're growing these trees to reforest the degraded hillsides and landscape. And the students helped to bring in the soil to fill 3,000 pots you know, with 60,000 little seedlings. That's a lot of work to water them, to take care of them. And, uh, and so the, the university, the local government and Duke are working together in, in these kinds of projects. Um, so the Ministry of the Environment is one organization that's working on this, but there are a lot of kind of grassroots efforts that uh, are supported by different uh, non-government organizations or NGOs. And here is a nursery that's run by one of the communities. Um, this is Florian. He's not only the um, tree nursery technician, he's also a teacher at the local school. So he really has a lot of, um, a lot of um, ability to engage students in these kinds of activities. And he's really great with the students. Um, together, they've, his goal, he told me in, in October, was to have 10,000 seedlings in his nursery. And by December, he had 12,000. So he already surpassed his goal. And these, these he gives to the local community, the farmers, so they can plant where they like. And the community as a group came together to say, we want to do a beach restoration because this is a coastal community. They just live right on the beach. And so we are helping to contribute more seedlings to this effort. So here we gave about 1500 seedlings as part of a, a consortium with a German organization, the Diversity Turn and Land Use Sciences. And uh, we gave these seedlings as well as those seedlings that they were already uh, growing in their nursery to the community and they planted them out on this beach. And this is gonna help to prevent the beach erosion. They're seeing that kind of sand just washing away every year. Uh, but it's also important to help with uh, what we call a windbreak. So when they get storms like hurricanes, those winds just come ripping off the ocean and really do a lot of damage. But where you've got big uh, trees to block that wind, it can help to prevent some of that storm surge. We also um, try to create economic um, opportunities with these trees. So we're doing cash crop uh, farming as well. Here is um, uh, Torian, uh, excuse me, Auguste and Marceline who are running a tree nursery at one of the local schools. And here in the bottom right, these are native trees that are forest trees from Madagascar, but they're also growing what we call cash crops. These are things like coffee, which is here in the middle. Coffee actually comes from a tree in case you uh, never knew. Cacao, which is where chocolate comes from, that's another tree, and all these uh, very yellow leaves that you can see on the, on the sides, that's, that's chocolate. There's also cloves, it's another kind of spice, and all these different trees uh, can provide a source of income. So it's, uh, it's about restoring the landscape as well as getting an economic benefit. We're also working in what's called regenerative agriculture. This is like an organic farming that goes a step further. Uh, that we're really trying to bring that soil back to life. The farmers tell us when they describe their soil, they say the soil is dead. And really when you look at it, and especially in these beach communities, it's very sandy soil. In other places, it can be uh, rock hard because of the erosion. So you really need to bring that soil back to life or regenerate it. And here we are with a local farming community, as well as students from the university 
at a workshop that we conducted in Madagascar. And so here we, were, we, we collaborated with the farmers and the students to show them how they can use locally available materials. Here, Lily is showing you handfuls of compost, um, ashes from the cooking fire, because people there still uh, cook with uh, mostly firewood. And they're mixing that into the soil to help bring it back to life. And you can see we did this in, right in the middle of a community where the school children have an opportunity to see and other community members can see. And this is, this is actually, it's nothing new to them. Um, they're used to making compost and they're used to these kinds of natural um, methods. But in recent years, things like chemical fertilizers and pesticides have been introduced and become more common. And folks, you know, they, they, they know that their yields are declining and they want to do something. So they are often uh, told that these fertilizers can be really good. But especially some of these chemicals uh, can be harmful to human health. There's actually a lot of pesticides that have been banned in America or in Europe, but they're still widely available in Madagascar. They were banned because they're bad for human health. Um, so um, when we talk with local farmers, actually one of the farmers told us that this kind of farming that we were doing is bulanjazana, the way of farming of our ancestors, because we don't use any of those chemicals. It's also a really great way to empower women. Women are fundamental to agricultural value chains. They're, they're really important farmers, but often they are underrepresented in a training like this. Um, they're less likely to get loans from the bank to be able to do the kind of this kind of experimental farming. And for the students, you know, they, they're, they're often there's kind of a, a, a male dominated society where women have a very specific role and uh, we're really trying to help those women to to break out of that role a little bit learn more about um, agricultural business as well so this is all many factors that are involved uh, and we're seeing fantastic results just within two weeks uh, these model gardens were already popping with life we planted diverse kinds of beans here you can also see tomato and lemongrass all growing together. Uh, we focus on what's called polyculture. So this is different from monoculture where you have just one kind of crop. Polyculture, you have many. And this can really help the farmers because if one crop fails, if there's bugs that eat it or if the season's just not right, uh, they may have another crop that they can fall back on. But if they only have one type of crop and that goes wrong, then they have nothing. So, so we're trying to uh, really promote uh, polyculture. And so today I want to highlight uh, one of the farmers, Jeannot, who was really engaged and adamantly enthusiastic about the training that we did. And he immediately went out to his field and, and made his own garden. And so this is his field uh, back in November, or actually beginning of December, where he's used, you can see this uh, dead uh, grass on top that's like a mulch to help keep the soil moist. And he's planted it with corn, his beans, and a variety of plants. And here is his farm in February. It's already bursting with life with these uh, corn, squash, peanuts, cassava, and even rice grown without slash and burn and without flooding the fields. Uh, and so here, uh, just yesterday, I got an update from Jeannot's field and his rice is almost ready to harvest. And it, you know, this is, it may not seem like much for us uh, where we're used to seeing our rice in a bag at the store, but for these folks, you know, this, I, I even referred to it as bulamena, it's gold. It's really important to the local folks. So I just kind of want to wrap up briefly by talking about what we can do. You know, often when, when we're hearing things like this about stuff going on in other parts of the world, we really want to do something to help, but we just don't know how. And so I want to start by pointing out that, um, you know, we, most of the viewers uh, of this presentation who are living in the high income countries or the North and, and West, we have a disproportionate impact on the globe and the, the global ecology compared to places like Madagascar. So in this map, where I'm showing what's called the ecological footprint or really how much uh, natural resources the countries are using. And the darker the shade of purple, the more resources we are using. So you can see how this is really uh, disproportionately uh, distributed across the globe. So we as, as uh, members of the high income countries can do a lot for places like Madagascar with the choices we make every day. Things like just turning off your lights when you're not in the room, not letting the water run, 
Um, those basic things about you know being thrifty with our resources are, are huge. I like to take opportunities like this to talk about plastics and single use uh, uh, plastics, which you know we may use them here in the U.S. and then they get in the ocean, and next thing you know they're turning up in um, you know islands in the Pacific. So you know avoiding using plastic shopping bags and utensils, things like that, can have a really big impact. We also need to recognize that a lot of our products come from places like Madagascar. So electronics have lots of different kinds of metals that come originally from places like the Congo or Madagascar. So think about these things when we're buying our uh, electronic products. Palm oil is another one that you know is usually uh, very, not grown in a sustainable way. So you really wanna watch out for palm oil in your products. So these, these are the kinds of things that we can do from home uh, but I also like to point out that the Duke Lemur Center Saba Conservation Program is 100% funded by donations and grants. And so if you are interested, you can go to the website, the lemur.duke.edu and check it out and share it with other folks and spread the word about what we're doing. And that's a really big help. And so, you know, we've gotten funding and I want to thank our sponsors from a lot of different organizations. We couldn't have done it without these groups. And we're continuing to apply for more grants. And um, I want to take this time also to thank our partners in Madagascar. Like I mentioned, Laura Diada, she's our Duke liaison, and she's uh, got a background in environmental education. That's a whole other topic that maybe for another event we could talk about how we're working with the school kids and teachers to uh, promote environmental education. This is Lantu Anjian Anjasana. He's a Malagasy program coordinator uh, who's based in, in our our program in Sambaba in Madagascar. This is Charlie Welsh, the conservation coordinator at Duke. Uh, Vita Modest and Bruno are some of our environmental education trainers. They help to teach teachers about incorporating environmental education into the curriculum. And then of course, uh, Rob Beymanansua Torien, who's working with us on our farming projects. And Bena Suavina uh, uh, Evra, who's a jack of all trades, environmental education, farming, research. Um, and then I'll just close by letting you know our motto, which is Miyara Watiala Mumbuli Fiainana. You protect the forest, life will grow. And I'll take any more questions you guys have. All right, James, let's get you to come back from that uh, screen share. If you hit the stop at the top, we'll get you nice front and center again. Perfect. All right, thanks for that great presentation. Madagascar is such an amazing place. I mean, the biodiversity, the life, insects that taste like bacon and eggs. <laughs> Um, and yeah, I mean, it's always tough to hear stories uh, of the loss of so much habitat and species, but it's also good to hear there's a lot of groups working hard to kind of turn that around and make sure that the people and the environment can coexist and, and, and both can get what they need. Yeah, very well said. All right. So I'm going to give a couple seconds for people to jump back into the quiz room. We have a good group there waiting to start. A uh, little quick update, it takes each question, you have 20 seconds, the quicker you answer, uh, the more points you get. And of course, um, it has to be right. That's a big key thing too. So I picked a few multiple choice questions from James's talk. Let's see how people are doing. So I'm starting the quiz. The first question is up. Madagascar is sometimes called Lemur Town, the eighth continent or Cloud Island. Let's see who was paying attention. All right, first question is done. It looks like I tricked most with lemur town. Although sure, there's lots of lemurs. I'm not sure that too many refer to Madagascar as, as lemur town, but the correct answer is the eighth continent and 39% went with that. All right, let's move on to the next question. This time we are curious about the Duke Lemur Center. Is it located in Canada, Michigan, Los Angeles, or North Carolina? So who remembers when James mentioned that? It wasn't too long ago. All right, a few more seconds. All right, we did a little better with that one. 72% rolled with North Carolina. All right, let's jump on to that next question. So this time we're curious about endemic. James used the word endemic. Does that mean found in one place in the world? Is that only comes out at night? Is it common in many countries or did it mean very cute? All those endemic lemurs. A couple more seconds. 
All right. Good job, everybody. 63% rolled with uh, found in one place. 5% thought very cute. And although that is true uh, about lemurs, it's not what we were looking for. Next question rolling right now. What was James's favorite lemur? Was it the sportive lemur, the ring-tailed lemur, the dwarf lemur, or the mouse lemur? So we talked about that right at the beginning, the first Q&A action. All right, good job. 65% went with the dwarf lemur. Rolling on to the question coming up next. Evidence shows that people were first on Madagascar 100 years ago, 10,000 years ago, or 100,000 years ago. Got a few more seconds to finish that one. All right, good job, everybody. Over 80% went with 10,000 years ago. I believe we have one more question to wrap things up. And this one is about the forest loss in Madagascar. Is it 1.2 million football fields, 3,000 football fields? Is it 80% or it's all gone? A few more seconds to wrap us up. All right, so we've got over half went with 1.2 million football fields. Let's tally those results, see our leaderboard. Elena Welch, six out of six in one minute and six seconds. George C, six out of six in one minute, 14. And then Leah B, five out of six in 50 seconds. Good job, everyone. Thanks for paying attention uh, and playing with us today. Let's grab a few more questions. So Ms. Rigo, I see you have your hand up. Uh, go Hi. ahead with the question. Hi, everyone. Um, so my question is, I know that you said that um, Madagascar is the size of Texas, and I know you showed us a lot of uh, agricultural photos. I'm just wondering, are there any more urban centers or is um, Madagascar primarily a rural agricultural island? Thank you for that. Yeah, I, I definitely tend to focus on the countryside because that's you know where I like to spend my time. And they, they do have uh, several urban centers uh, that are, are pretty highly de uh, developed. I mean, you'll, you'll, like I think I mentioned, you know, you can find an internet cafe just about every corner and um, most, you know, they have like very nice uh, hotels and things like that. But uh, a lot of folks, I, I think it's, I don't, uh, I have to check the numbers, but it's about 70% of the population are still rural farmers. So it's these just, I think, and I don't quote me yet, but it's about eight big cities, major cities with very high population densities. And then the rest is very, very um, spread out, very remote and rural. All right, good question. Wayne, I see your hand is up uh, and you're unmuted. Go ahead, Wayne. What is the least popular lemur in Madagascar? Hmm. That is an interesting question. I'm going to uh, jump back through my slides so I can show you the picture. And you know, that's it's always very uh, beauty is eye in the in, in the eye of the beholder. Of course, um, I think they're all beautiful. But there is one lemur that is um, somewhat unpopular in Madagascar because um, they have a a story about the animal that they're very superstitious and they think it's a bad luck. Uh, animal. So let's see if I can show you this one. This is called the eye eye. And it's this lemur. Let's see if I don't get big. This lemur right here. Can you see my cursor circling it? It's kind of scary looking. If you look at him really quick, he's got this dark body, but with this crazy grizzly hair and freaky long fingers. And he's actually got teeth like a rodent. Very different from most primates. And so because it's nocturnal, it only goes out at night, so people don't usually see it. Uh, because it's kind of freaky looking, <laughs> there are a lot of stories that, and superstitions that if you see this animal, something bad might happen to you or your family. And the only way to prevent that bad luck from happening is to kill the animal. So there, I would, if I had to say, that would be the people's least favorite. But that doesn't, that's not true of all Madagascar. And, um, you know, it's kind of an, a traditional story. A lot of people these days don't necessarily believe in it, but it's still uh, out there. All right. I personally think eyes are super cool. If you look them up on YouTube, they've got this big long finger they use to tap on the tree 
And they're almost like a woodpecker. They're listening with that tap for a hollow spot to find a grub. So I think they're pretty darn cool. So if you look on, I think there's a really cool BBC clip where they got some great footage of it. So definitely check that out. Yeah. Uh, Cordelia and Huxley in Waterloo. Let me turn your mic back on. Um, I was wondering what is the biggest challenge with researching lemurs? Hmm. Great question. Thank you. The, and it really depends on the kind of research that people are doing. For me, uh, what I was most interested in my research was to try to figure out how abundant or how rare species were in different kinds of habitats. So like where I worked in the rainforest, um, you can, you know, the, the park where I worked, there were about 13 species that were known to live there. But if you go out there on any one day, you're not gonna see all 13, you might see one, you might see three. So actually it took me three years of hiking all over the rainforest every day, every night with a big team of Malagasy assistants that we literally uh, 1500 kilometers worth of hiking around the forest, searching for lemurs. And like I said, for some of the, for some of the lemurs like the eye eye, I only saw it twice. So that was a very big challenge for me is how rare the animals really are and how um, specific they are and the kinds of habitats they need. Like if I return to this picture with the, um, the bamboo lemur, they need bamboo, obviously. So this one over here, uh, who's uh, noshing on some bamboo in the picture, if there's a forest that doesn't really have any bamboo in it, they can't survive there. This one similarly is the rough lemur, they eat 90% ripe fruit. So if there's not enough fruit in the habitat, they can't live there. Other species are much more common. This one, like the uh, avahi, they eat leaves of trees that are very common and you can go out on any given night and you're probably gonna see those mouse lemurs, um, but others are very, very rare. So that was very challenging for me. But then other people face challenges of, for example, um, you may hear in one of our Duke Lemur Center events, uh, researchers who study uh, aspects of their genetics or of the stomach uh, bacteria. And they've got to chase these lemurs around and try to catch their poop because inside the poop, there's a lot of data, but it can be challenging because, you know, the lemurs are running through the forest pooping and now you got to try and chase them and find that poop in the forest. So you'll hear more about that soon, hopefully. All right. Well, James, one more quick question before we wrap up from YouTube. Uh, COVID-19, as, as Madagascar, you know, it's island nature helps spare it from some of the impacts or are they struggling uh, right now? That's uh, very timely and I appreciate getting that question because we, we are really worried about our colleagues in Madagascar um, and, and around the world, obviously. So we've been really, really worried about COVID getting into a lot of these tropical, especially African countries, because we've seen how, um, you know, their healthcare infrastructure is not, not like what we have in the United States or in, in Canada, especially. So it can be really devastating when there's a disease. In Madagascar in 2017, they had a plague outbreak. In 2019, they had a measles outbreak. Um, so we were really, really scared that something bad would happen. But actually, I have to say that the president of Madagascar has done a really great job of, um, from the very beginning, preventing ships from coming in where they suspected people uh, had come from places where they may be infected. Uh, they stopped flights from Italy and other countries very early on, and then they have started confinement very early. And actually right now they have 150 cases, uh, plus or minus. Most of the people have either recovered or they're still in hospital, but I think there's still no deaths. So I have to really commend them. They've done a, a pretty great job, and it's really hard for them now because, I mean, you're talking about a lot of people who depend on just day-to-day -day income. Now they can't go out. They can't do their work but they've really been largely compliant and, and patient and helping to, to keep this under control. So I really hope for the best for them that they continue. All right. Well, first of all, James, I'd like to give a huge shout out to YouTube. We had such a great group joining us live on YouTube today from all over the place. Thank you for your great questions and joining us today. If you do stick around on YouTube, we've got an event with the Toronto Zoo starting in a couple minutes. You can learn about some zoo crews. So some of the animals that live in packs or herds, our schools. Uh, you can learn about some of those animals and see some of them at the zoo. Uh, huge shout out to all the groups who are with us on camera today. Thank you to the students and the educators who came in with us and for your great questions. And James, thanks for kicking off a great starter event with the Duke Lemur Center. We're excited 
uh, to have more events. Great, thank you for having me. Thank you all for your awesome questions and your interest and enthusiasm. And I look forward to more events in the future. All right, once again, thanks everyone for tuning in today and we are gonna sign off for now. All right, so we are live everyone. My name is Jesse and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants.